I sort of have to probably start before piano for you to get a sense because I didn't start the piano till a little bit later on. Um, it wasn't where my sort of musical roots were. Um, it, it, my sort of musical past originates from quite a young age, around about three years of age. And my father, he picked up in adulthood and um, the classical guitar and he, he was actually pretty good. And uh, he picked it up quite quickly. And from the, around about the age of three, I remember distinctly, it was one of my earliest memories. I remember really sort of taking an interest in what he was doing. And I was completely mesmerized by him playing. And um, like from there, I sort of really got interested in music myself. Um, my father then probably around about the age of four taught me to read music and give me a grounding in that. And then I started playing like a sort of mouse keyboard. I don't know if you've ever seen these things. No. They're like a kid blows uh -huh. into it and there's a, yeah. it's about like an octave and a half or something and like a little piano key and you just blow into it and it, it plays a tune. And then when I was around about five, I'd learned some tunes on this. And then in a school concert, I um, played um, a Christmas carol and I was only about five. So it was probably quite cute. And um, I remember... I remember that, that's another memory I've got as well, because when you're that kind of age, you only remember what's really important. Like probably how many memories have you got from before five? It's probably like a handful. And my father's guitar and standing up on stage and, and, and blowing into this mouth piano thing, you know, like both of those stuck in my head. And then around about the age of seven, um, I started getting violin lessons, you know, the standard school sort of violin teacher type person who comes in and teaches a group of people at a time and all that. So I got involved with that. And then yeah. I continued with that for some time. And um, around about the age of 11, um, I'd sort of got some basic skills in, in the violin by then. And I joined lo a um, local youth orchestra and did that for a few years. And that oh. was really fun. But... <laughs> Yeah. So, but it was then around about the age of 14, I was still playing the violin, but I wasn't really loving it. You know, it was, I was, I think it was probably that thing when you're that age where you realize you've got, you've got so far in the exam system. And from this point on, if you want to get any further, you're going to really have to love it because it's going to be hard work. And I was at that tipping point where I wasn't really loving it for whatever reason. And I'd already started tinkering with the piano and I really sort of really fancied giving it a proper go. Um, so around about 14, yeah, I started playing about and I taught myself the basics for a couple of years. Oh, wow. And then, yeah, I was becoming quite seriously into it. So I managed to get hold of some lessons and I had about 25 lessons. And there was a few issues I had because I taught myself and, and, and the teacher was able to sort of put me on the right set in and, and, and ground a few basics for me, some things which maybe weren't, you know, things that weren't working out very well, only because I was probably just being a bit lazy with, you know, not being taught how to do it properly. I'd probably found a few shortcuts, which is okay if you're playing basic stuff, but as soon as you start getting into more advanced repertoire, you need, uh, you need to be doing the real, you know, the real thing properly to, to be able to play properly. So that was around about the age of... Um, I think it was 16, 17. So, and then I, well, by 18, I wanted to go to, um, uh, to study music at university. But because I picked up the piano quite late and I'd fallen out of love with the violin, I was on, I was on a back foot. So I, I took a bit of a gamble and I thought, well, this was around about 16. I realized if I put some work in, I could probably get to grade eight, which grade eight is the entrance exam, the basic level to get into music uh, college or university yeah so I just skipped all the grades and I just bombed straight up to grade eight um, and at 18 I took the exam in the summer before the um, course started in September so lastminute.com um, so in four years I managed to get up to the grade and I, and I actually got a distinction which I think I just winged it and like I, I survived you know I managed to get it done um, I wasn't totally confident in the time scale of getting getting to that point but i got in so so yeah that's that's the sort of um the, and where i got introduced introduced to the piano and, and where it went from there that's really great i mean 
and you, you really fell in love with the piano, and I can really tell that you love it. Um, just from the way you talked about it, especially in our group that we're in, that's about musicians with Estonia. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, the violin was okay, but I don't know why. I was just tired of it. Maybe because I'd done it for a number of years and I never really loved it. Um, but the piano, I just thought, this is great. You can play a whole tune, yeah? You know, <laughs> you can just you can just do it whenever you want, and, and it's a whole piece of music. And and yeah, no, I really I really got into the piano in a big way. Um, obviously, I was a um, a late starter, and that in itself, as you, as you know, Katie, is a very significant risk for mm -hmm. the development of dystonia later on. If you're a if you're a late starter and starting the piano for most professionals would be in the region of what like four or five six years of um yeah, age um, the roots of it, it i think go back to the time when i was learning the piano and i would say the very first seed was sown well the first seed i can remember this thing because i thought about this quite a lot i thought if i can remember something that happened that didn't go so well 22 years ago then it was obviously significant at the time because you're only going to remember i mean can you remember all the playing that you've done in your life you know yeah like, can you remember all the playing you've even done in exams or concerts in your life probably not but i remember specifically this one thing all this time and that was because when I was, because I started so late, I don't think I sort of established the basic, sort of like the, the basics with the piano um, from the outset. And I was learning my pieces for my grade eight. And like, I was having some reservations about the like Haydn sonata I was playing and the Bach and the Chopin, which, which a lot of people would have been scared of. I just blasted out and that was my, that was my highest score and that was like effortless yeah even though it was probably technically more difficult and certainly expression wise it required a lot more but when i came to the Haydn, there was this passage which was a like it was quite tricky uh, it, and it was in the sort of uh, development section as you'd imagine where it starts getting a little bit more a little bit a little bit more off piste and there was some sort of semi waver movements where the left hand and then the right hand would do it and I, I never really mastered it before the exam and on the day itself I was anticipating the failure of this particular passage and indeed I, I fluffed it you know I, I, I didn't do so well with that and it was only a minor a minor moment in, in the overall piece but that's pretty much all I can remember of the exam and this was the whole point I realized that this kind of mentality I had at the time was probably a massive massive risk um because if i just made a mistake and then i remembered enjoying the you know playing the piece of music it wouldn't have been significant but i can't remember anything apart from the fact that i enjoyed the show plan and the exam and i thought it was fantastic and that i dreaded playing this Haydn, and i can only remember this one little bar or two bars where it was a trauma okay so that was the first, the first thing. And then after, when I got to the end of the exam, a few weeks later, I got invited to like a high scorers concert because I did so well in the exam. Well, quite surprising. You know, I, I really think the examiner must have just been having a good day, but I couldn't do it because I just couldn't face those pieces again because you, you had to play the pieces you played in the exam. And I thought there's no way I'm ever looking at those pieces again. Thanks. Yeah. So I didn't go to the, to the concert. And then, um, so I got into, into Goldsmiths University down in London to do a music, um, music degree. And I was not confident at all with playing. And one, my heart was saying, yeah, you know, this is great. But there was another part of my, my body and head that was saying, no, this is, this is a problem, you know, but it was at the back of my mind. It's not the kind of thing you're thinking of in the front there. It's sort of simmering in the back of your mind, like a sort of stress. Yeah. And 
um, it was at the end of my first year. I was prepare, preparing for a um, um, performance exam, and I prepared some pieces, and um, I sort of mentally geared myself up now. Um, and the day before the the day before the exam, I was um, sort of getting my head around the idea of like having a couple of the lecturers sitting there and you know sort of paying attention. And I, I could cope with that. I thought, yeah, I can play these. It's just going to be a couple of lecturers I already know there. And then literally the day before, I find out that it's actually the entire course that's going to be sat there. So we're all going to be watching each other. And I hadn't mentally geared up for this at all. I just didn't know this was going to be the case. And oh, wow. can you imagine, yeah, the day before you play in these pieces, which you're not that confident with anyway, the day before finding out you're going to be playing to like over 100 people, uh, it was, I survived. And I, I did make a bit of a, a, fl a, a flunk, you know, at one point, but overall it was probably all right. But again, I can't actually re remember the music. I can't remember anything apart from making this mistake and the, and the trauma of, of like not being prepared to play in front of over a hundred people, you know? <laughs> and, and then um, after that, it was into the next year, about halfway through, and it was coming up to the time where I'd be doing performing again, and I just couldn't stomach it anymore. And uh, I, I ended up not finishing the course because, but at the time I didn't really fully comprehend why I didn't want to do it. I didn't, I think I was like burying the emotions away and like it, I couldn't face up to it maybe like when I'm like 19 or 20 or something, I just, no, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I, of course, and um, um, from there, I sort of like, I was disappointed because, you know, music is a big part of my identity. Mm -hmm. And I still carried on playing um, like privately at home, and, and and I did you know on a regular basis. I didn't really sort of um, push myself or anything like that. And I didn't really see much of a progression in skills, um, but I still just like playing at home, um, and it was just you know, a recreation, something to do. Yeah, it, it, it really left, I think it left um, a sense of dissatisfaction in my mind because I wasn't fulfilling my potential and it was probably quite frustrating, I suppose, but I didn't really understand these feelings at the time. And then, so if you fast forward a bit now, so at this point I haven't got dystonia and I'm just playing at home in my 20s or whatever, this is great, just playing regularly probably probably a few times a week most of, most of the time and, and just if there was something I couldn't play I just skipped over it yeah I, I wasn't really worried I didn't care if I couldn't play like all the Beethoven sonata I just played the bits I could play and then whatever I wasn't really at this point obviously I'd left college I'd got a normal job and I was just doing it for fun so it, it really wasn't important at that point and it was quite a lot of stuff I couldn't do and I just couldn't be bothered to practice, you know, and sometimes I probably, I think I probably, I, I think I recognized there was a block with some things, but I didn't push it. So I just let, let the block be and I just, just skipped over it or just busked it. I mean, back then, which just seems crazy now to like, I could just rattle through something and not even like, like almost like sight read it. It was like, I didn't really care what it came out like. And like it was probably quite reasonable actually like because when you're not paying that much attention it's quite possible to rattle through stuff that's even quite difficult reasonably well because you're not judging whether it's going to work or not yeah so then if you fast forward now so i'm going into my 30s i think i think, I think it was about 2015 maybe i really sort of I really felt unfulfilled um, with the musical aspect of my life. And I thought, right, I, this is time to, to do something different. And, and I, I want to change this. And I was really geared up. And I, I, think, I think a lot of the trauma comes from walking away from university with no qualification to show for it. And I thought, do you know what? I'm going to take a performance diploma, 
which is a similar sort of level to a university degree, but it's it's centered around um, just performance and, and, and talking about performance. You know, it, it just go al- it, you just go along on a day, you play about 40 minutes worth of music from a pre-selected list, and then you, you have a chat about it, and then you go home and that's it. But it's, you know, it shows that you can actually play. I thought, yeah, I'll do that. That sounds great. Um, <laughs> but already I realized that the part, the, the the pass mark was quite high and that in an average year, the majority of people who enter it actually fail. So I was, I was gearing myself up to enter an exam where most people don't even pass, let alone get a distinction because it was two pass marks. You could have a pass or a distinction. And, um, well, I thought if I'm going to do it, I want to make sure that I can get a distinction. Yeah. Otherwise what's the yeah. point? And, wow. um, so, so I started playing a lot more and also taking it more seriously. Um, and I, I would say the first year, I probably saw the development of quite a lot of skills I didn't have, but I wouldn't say I was without issue. I would say I already had some sort of tendency to things being wrong. And the first actual evidence I have of a physical problem, and I'm not saying this was when the start of the problem was, but this was the first physical evidence that we actually have on video, was in around about 2016. And in the right hand, you can clearly see there's something abnormal going on. And this doesn't surprise me at all because I was so concerned with, you know, doing a great job in the exam and, 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 and getting, that, getting that qualification that I just couldn't even play for fun anymore. And I only, I only recognized this in hindsight. At the time, I, I wasn't really that aware what I was doing to myself and I just couldn't even allow myself to make a mistake you know I'd practice and like when things weren't going right I'd repeat it and I'd repeat it again and of course you know what it's like if you start repeating things because they're not working it gets worse and it, it started to really really go downhill like and I mean majorly downhill I would say by 2017 I probably had a very significant disability but I just didn't realize I was still trying to like battle through. And then as time went by, I started to realize something serious, something serious was wrong. And I, at first I thought it must've been a physical problem. And I made, I made the whole thing 10 times worse because the first thing you do when you have a physical problem is you think, okay, I need to look at my posture. I need to look at my wrist height. I need to look at all these different things. And once you start looking at these kinds of things, you're then interfering with the world of the physical. And it might work for like five minutes or 10 days, but it soon comes back to bite you on the bum. And um, so I did so much of this chopping and changing. And I would watch other players and I would think, okay, I'm going to do that because he looks like he's having a great time. Let me see if I can replicate what he's doing. And, oh, my God, I just probably did the worst thing you could ever do. And then when we get into, so we're coming up to 2018 now, I was really, really concerned. And I actually went to the doctor in February 2018. Because before that, I'd taken a couple of weeks off because I thought if I've got a physical problem, then I need to uh, have a little rest and let it fix itself up. And I did have, at this point, I did have a little bit of, um, little bit of, um, like ulnar nerve compression and that was because of the dystonia because basically my posture had gone so strange that it was causing like a lot of um, abnormal movements and then that was like putting pressure on the on the nerves so having this little bit of nerve pain sent me on a wild goose chase to the doctors so I went down the doctors he gave me some anti-inflammatories again I had a few weeks off and I thought right I'm ready to play now I got no pain this is fantastic so sit down to play the first day probably wasn't actually that bad by the third or fourth day i was literally almost un- unable to even touch the keyboard uh, i couldn't even it, it's difficult to describe but i put my hand onto the piano and i, I wouldn't even know katie 
you've gone quiet. Hold on, Katie, I can't hear you. Sorry, can you try and say that again? Your your audio's gone. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, you're back. Sorry, what okay. did you say? I, I was asking uh, which, hands, which hands were affected. Um, at this stage, it was only the right hand. Um, and I've, I'll come to this later on, but there was probably a, a problem developing in the left hand also, but it was still functional and the right hand was, was the main problem. In fact, the left hand at that stage was probably quite okay. Um, I'm not saying it didn't have any issues, but it, it could do quite a lot of stuff. And I used to think to myself, wow, I can do all this stuff with my left hand, but I can't do anything with my right hand. It's, to it's a total mess. And like the, the situation was, as soon as I would put my hand on the piano and start playing, I basically it was detached. It was not, it was as if it wasn't even there anymore. I couldn't even put my hand on the instrument. Like I couldn't even put, a, like it wouldn't even hold any sort of posture. As soon as my fingers started moving, it, it just shut down. There was nothing going on. I couldn't even play like a single note in certain circumstances. And if you can imagine not, not even being able to work out how to play one note, like anything that was moving down the keyboard, it got to a point where I couldn't even like, I could play something going up and as soon as it was going, so say for example, I was playing like, this is how extreme it was at this point. If I was playing like, like C, D, E, and then it was going back to D, just before going back to D, everything was shut down because it was going left. So anything that moved left was gone. It was totally deleted. And so I thought I did myself some serious physical damage at this point. And so I went to the doctor, anti-inflammatory, got the pills, and I got all that sorted, but it got worse. And then it got to April, and this was the absolute crisis point, because I'd already figured out by now that something else was, this is the point where I started to really think about this logically. And I thought, I used the left hand to like give me a guide, and I played an arpeggio or something up and down, and I watched it, and I noticed that it did pretty much the same thing going up as it did going down. So there was no extra movements one way. There was no extra difficulty or strain one way. It, it was the same both ways. It was just like an opposite movement of the what you did going up, coming down. It was just opposite of each other. It mirrored each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. So I, I did the same with the right hand. I went up, did the arpeggio. And then as soon as I went to come down, everything shut down. And I thought, well, I, that cannot be physical because it's the same movement going up and down. And that's when I started to dig a little bit deeper on the internet. And I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd already seen about focal dystonia only because I'd been doing so much Googling on like, um, on like uh, strain injuries and stuff like that, which is what I thought I had. I'd done so much Googling. Every now and again, there would be, if you read something about carpal tunnel syndrome, it'd also be something about um, focal dystonia, but it always says this is a really rare condition, really rare. So I'd not even thought it was possible. And I, I'd only sort of glanced at it, but I started reading in a little bit more detail and I got interested. And this was the really, this was the, the big eye opener because I just came across this video, which I, I wish I could find again. So it was really good, but I, I, I never found it. I think it's gone. Um, and this guy, this, this piano teacher, was like retraining somebody who had focal dystonia and when i watched that video and did some of the exercises oh my god i just knew i knew immediately this is what i had um and there could be no doubt in this, you know yeah i'm so sorry that this happened to you by the way it, it's really difficult Thanks. for all of us yeah, I mean, at the time, it was devastating when I think back. Because when you find out you've got dystonia, it's like you can't believe it because there's no cure as such. And, and, and the first thing I found on Google was like, just close the lid and go home, basically. Like, give up. 
And I thought, oh my God, this is horrendous. Horrendous. And it was actually, luckily finding this video then, and then I also found some stuff to do with, um, like, some of the work I even do now is probably quite similar, but like, um, like leaving a pause, just as you have a problem, just leave a pause and then play, and also like mental imagery work and stuff. And I did the sensible thing at this point for the third, probably the first time ever, after totally messing myself up, I actually got sensible. It took me to like mid thirties to do the first sensible thing. And that was, I realized that I had to stop playing all the repertoire I was playing because it was way too fast. And like, this is what got me into the mess. I sort of understood that I needed to scale back a little bit here and maybe do some, do something different. So I, I, I started, I played, I thought, mm, but, you know, I quite like Greek lyric pieces and stuff like that. They're a bit easier for some of them. And I thought if I start doing some of that, um, and it, to be fair, it was, it was a good decision because in the first month where I had, and I'm, the sensory deprivation I had, it was extreme. And I mean, the only thing that stopped me having a more significant disability away from the piano is because it was triggered primarily by fine motor control on the surface. Normal activities that didn't involve like a flat horizontal surface. So normal day to day activities like would actually improve the, improve the function. I didn't really understand this at the time, but I'd realized that when I was doing gross motor tasks, like in my day job, by the end of the day, I'd feel looser in the hands. And then after the piano, I'd feel really tight and I couldn't use my, you know, you couldn't use my right hand again. And why, I understand why that is now because like, I think the, the general sort of day-to-day um, -day activity was actually um, increasing the sensory information going back to the brain. And when I was playing the piano, the damage was so severe and I was so like, I got myself into such a mess where my ego was con was just totally mixed up with the movement that it, it basically shut off all sensory information. So I think it one, and also um, when it was really bad, I lost almost all sensation. So it actually was a physical thing in that sense. I had almost no sensation in the ring finger at all. I couldn't feel pain. I couldn't feel touch. I could only feel like, like I could only feel like a, a sort of dull sense in it, and that was it. If I stroked like fingers with a pen or my other hand, I would feel like a tickle, but I got to the ring finger and there was no sensation. There. I couldn't even feel it unless I was pressing hard. So, you know, um, so for the first month, I did some stuff which I found online, which again, I can't find, I haven't found this again, um, but it was like very basic, like remapping, like where I was like turning my hand upside down like this on the piano and actually um, playing notes upside down. Mm -hmm. And it sounds crazy, but it actually did a lot. And it, in the first month, in just a month, I was able to put my hand on the piano again. And wow. like I had some, some returning sensation and idea of what was going on, but it was still very, lim very limited. And then, so this was around summertime now in 2018. And I, I carried on um, for around about six months and I've managed to sort of calm it down enough to be able to like, well, I, I don't know. I, I, when I say calm it down, it was still really bad, but I was still playing a few pieces and I just, every time something went left, it, I couldn't play. But I just sort of carried on just trying to play basic pieces, you know? from like my Greek lyric book, because that was about all I could manage. And then it was around about the end of that year, so end of 2018, where I'd, I didn't really know where to go from here because I didn't really feel like I was getting very far. And I'd come across this idea about using splints, oh. which I give that a go. And, you know, it was a bit crazy. And, and I think I've, I spent seven months doing this and I came to the conclusion because when I was doing it, it was so boring. I started doing mind games and I started to realize that there was actually nothing going on in the splints and everything going on in my head. So what I was thinking in my head 
was actually changing what was happening um, on the ground, sort of thing. And, it, and the splints were just like um, almost like a, a trick to like get me out of my own head. Would you? So, would you? Would you say that it's like a placebo effect? Definitely, definitely. Because when you're using the splints, I think you don't care so much. And that, I think that's part of maybe why they work for some people. Um, because if, you, if there's not really, really an outcome as such anymore, because you're just doing this basic stuff, then maybe you zone out enough. You zone out some of the time. And then when you zone out, your brain is sort of like probably remapping a little bit. But you just don't realise this is what's happening. You could achieve the same thing, I believe, without having splints. But I think the splints, like, offer a way to, like, stop trying too hard and stop trying to play pieces. Because when you think, I'm not, not going to play pieces now, I'm just going to, like, do the splinting. And then you zone out, you get a bit bored, you start, your mind starts wandering, and then maybe something happens. But it only took me so far. It calmed down some of the... Because basically what I realised at that point was that... Um, there was a very extreme event where like the fight or flight response was actually like when I when I couldn't touch the piano, I didn't really understand that the fight that at the time that the fight uh, or flight response was actually through the roof. And I mean, it was like I was being chased, chased by a herd of elephants or something. It was that bad. So what it did when I was in splints, it got the fight or flight down to like a more manageable level. So at least then, because the problem is, if you've got really, really severe dystonia, unfortunately, I don't think many people actually get that bad. But when you really go off, off the scale, you can't <laughs> even calm down because you can't even make sense of anything when you're sat at the instrument because it's just a total noise in your head. So, <laughs> so I calm myself down enough to be able to then think, right, I can throw these spents in the bin now and then maybe move on from there. And at that point, because I've been become dissociated from like, like there was less connection between the playing like the movement because it was just in splits and the music i thought i thought it was pretty much done it was actually a point where i thought yeah this is great i i, I, I i've done it and as soon as i started playing again so I, I i threw the splints away and i started playing some pieces and it took about four days for the for the um for the whole thing to like crash again. So basically on the first day, I could play like reasonably well. It's not like a bit shaky and everything, but I thought, yeah, this is really working, you know? But by the fourth day, I realized there was a crisis going on again. And at that point, again, I thought, right, I can't, I can't go on to a fifth day and play because this is going to be a disaster and I'm going to undo all the sort of remapping work I've yeah. done. And I've got a bit of sensation back in my hand. I can't afford to, 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 to make that mistake again. And I spent about a month. So now we're into 2018 summer. No, 2019 summer. Sorry. Tw yeah, this, I think this is 2019 summer now. And like, I just spent about a month just toying about on the piano and I didn't really know what to do. And then I tried doing some of this like retraining I was doing in splints, but just on the piano. And I did that for a few months, but I started to realize that I was just actually delaying like the recovery because I started, I was at this point, I was getting a bit cleverer. I'd, you know, I'd done some reading and I'd also paid quite a lot of, quite a lot of attention to what was going on in my own mind and body when I felt and thought in certain ways. And I started to get quite wise to it. And I realized then that I just needed to actually become a musician again stop dicking about and then i would see much more improvement because i'm too afraid to actually play the bloody instrument and so i can't even play a piece of music because i'm scared i'm gonna get it wrong because going back to all them years ago scared to make mistakes then i try and do a diploma the fear of making mistakes is just astronomical in my mind still and i just it was um right at the end of 2019 when i really made the best decision i made which was to start playing some music again and just having a go and um like that was going really well 
and I saw significant changes and I was really starting to make headway, although I still had significant triggers for dystonia as we went into 2020. And then a few things happened in 2020, which like really helped. Um, firstly, the pandemic came along, which was really great because all of a sudden I didn't care if I could play because I was too scared. I thought I was going to die or something, you know, like everybody panicking at the beginning. Oh my God, it's a scary virus. And it, it totally <laughs> put the dystonia into context for about two months and it boxed it off. And there came a point where I realized actually I needed to capitalize on that and I needed to continue that feeling of like um, minimizing how much I care about it. So, so that was a really good thing. And then the second good thing that happened really was, and this was later on, because I kept having these blocks and it, I, I used to warm up for ages and like play lots of exercises before playing pieces to get me into it. And I thought, no, I, th I think that this isn't, this isn't working. And, and, I just scrapped doing all technical work and I just thought, what, what am I doing this for? Because to my corrupted mind, which is so damaged, if I'm doing a scale, all I'm doing is looking for a problem. Why am I practicing a scale? What, I should, why do I have to practice a scale when that's something which I shouldn't even have to question if I can do? So I thought I've got to stop this mentality altogether. And I thought, right, that's it. And then honestly, it was like, it was like a watershed. So I stopped, I stopped playing, I think this might have been summertime this, uh, in 2020, I stopped all technical work, I didn't do any warm-ups, I just sat down and I started, obviously ease myself in and get into the right mood, but I, I would just start playing stuff straight away. And within just weeks, I felt different already. And I started to see significant changes where I had a problem. And I still had a problem, but it was like becoming a, less of an issue all the time. It was reducing and reducing and reducing. And then, um, so I was feeling pretty good at this point. I was still having the odd crisis, because you know what it's like. You, you get somewhere and then you, some of the old habits creep in or you start feeling doubt or something. You have a bad day and something triggers off like this negative thought process that people with dystonia have that, Maybe healthy musicians don't even understand this is a thing. And it, you get into like a spiral. You, you see, you, you're nodding, Katie. You, you, you know. You know what I'm saying. Yes, I call exactly. it the dystonic death spiral. Do you think it's dystonic death spiral? Do you think that's yes. what you call it? Where you, something triggers something. <laughs> and then you, that negative thing you want to try and fix. And then you fall into the trap. You keep repeating it. And it gets worse and worse. And then you think, oh my God, I've just fallen into the trap again. You feel lousy for the rest of the day. And the next time you sit down, you've probably like either realized you made this mistake or you repeat it again. But hopefully you realize soon enough that you've got to stop the spiral and reset thought process. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. like, there have, there's been quite a lot of times when I've been in the, in the sort of dystonic death spiral. Um, but, and I will say, Say, I'm not exaggerating, I've probably had like over a hundred of these, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> like in the early days, it was probably like every day or every week. But then as time went by in 2020, they became less frequent. Um, but when they came along, they were worse because there was more at stake, I suppose. And then like the last one I had was about 12 weeks ago. I've not had one for 12 weeks. And when the last one happened, it was another significant watershed because I'd been figuring out more and more about what, what was going wrong and why, I, why sometimes progress would, st would stall and why I could be learning a piece of music and never quite get there with it. And I, I, I was already sort of understanding that like if I altered my behaviours more towards a healthy musician and a healthy mindset, as if I never had a problem, then I'd have more chance of overcoming these later on issues. Because as each, as the condition um, lessens, you're still left with significant, the issue, even though the physical symptoms are reducing, the amount of mental effort you have to put in and the amount of hurdles to like climb over don't seem to decrease. Because to reach a peak performance situation, you're gonna have to keep going until it's done. And like later on hurdles and no more 
are no easier to overcome than the early hurdles when I couldn't put my hand on the piano. So getting my hand on the piano two and a half years ago was no, no more difficult, no more easy than trying to like get the final bits done now. Mm. And I started to change the way I worked because at this point I realized, and this is really important folks if you're listening, I started to realize that anything you're thinking about at any time shouldn't be thought about at the same time as playing your instrument because it's not going to help you one bit. Nothing that goes in your head, that poxy little voice that never shuts up has to be diverted because you can't switch it off because if you try and switch it off, that's all you're thinking about is trying to switch it off. And if you're thinking about that, that is actually your voice anyway. So you, you, you're in a, you, you can't stop it. So you have to divert it. And then I realized that that's what peak performance is, is that the elite people in the field, the top players have actually retrained their attention span to be diverted onto full attention on what's actually happening here and now. And that means that you're not thinking about what's coming up. You're not thinking about what's just happened and whether it went well, because that is probably the fundamental root of dystonia is that you're thinking about you're not living in the here and now you're thinking you're worried about coming up to a mistake something that has caused you a mistake before or you're worried about the mistake you just made and when you're playing at a high level and in your mind a mistake is like a tiny nuance nobody else even knows that you didn't play that little bit of mozart perfectly well because they can't even hear that because they're not even listening at that level of detail it's only like it's only like somebody with a very critical ear that can, can even hear that kind of detail the average joe goes to a concert doesn't even hear that especially on a stage where it's like they're probably like 50 yards away how can they hear a tiny detail like that maybe on a super fine recording but mm -hmm. you know if you're not in the recording studio you don't even have to worry about that level of detail you know so like i started to understand that even the tiniest detail would perpetuate dystonia if you're worrying about it and that the, the altering of the behavior so that you don't even react to that um to that situation is, is absolutely key because again you can't just stop reacting because if you try and stop doing something you just end up trying to you just end up doing it all the more this is just part of the human psyche you can't get away from this fact you can't just stop doing something you have to do something different so then this is when I started to really understand that the movement system and how we play comes about through mental imagery and more of a holistic engagement with the process of music making. So I, um, I started learning music in a different way. So what I would do was before I started playing a piece of music and learning something, I would spend weeks before, at least two weeks, hearing different recordings and just listening to the recordings completely passively but totally attentively and I basically I, I retrained my responses so that I could hear every single thing in the recording and I knew the music inside out to listen to at this point I, I did look at the score sort of sometimes but I didn't really look at the score with any thoughts I just saw the score you know I just let the score be seen by my subconscious as opposed to me looking at the score and thinking oh look that bit looks hard no I, I just let the score be seen and I let the sounds be heard and that was what I did and I will say that retraining my attention span so that I can listen to a recording and not react and then really enjoy it um like um it's it's like um it, it primed my responses so that i realized that if i can hear everything in a recording i therefore understand the music and i know that every single part of the music orally and from a sort of um momentum set you know from a momentum point of view so i know everything about it so then the actual learning process then so if i retain that thought of like just being zoned out if you like of like the detail 
and, and, and really sort of like keep that in the forefront of the mind and that mental imagery. Then I could then go and learn the piece. And what happened was mm -hmm. actually transformative at this point. Because when I, when I was working like this and I started then playing these pieces, which I refrained from playing for weeks until I felt totally at ease and I was humming them in the car and, you know, the music kept popping into my head. But really importantly, the music in my head wasn't corrupted with any sense of um, technical details or any of that nonsense. It was just music in my head in a pure sense, as if I didn't even know how to play the instrument. I just heard the lovely music. Yeah. And then when I went to learn these pieces, I realized that I could actually then refer to this sensation. Yeah. And um, get out of my own head and stop um, and stop getting myself involved. So this was a really significant step forward. And I had to keep, like, um, I had to keep at it. Don't get me wrong, this wasn't like a five minute wonder. This was like sustained, and I'm still doing it now, sustained change. And like, one of the things I've, I'm doing over the last sort of um, 12 weeks especially, which has been really important, is whenever, whenever there's like, um, Basically, I started to recognize that when I've been playing, like even sometimes just for a few seconds or sometimes longer, there's some involvement starts to creep back in. Mm -hmm. So then when I recognize that I'm not totally in the moment, then that's when I like think, OK, I'm going to repeat that phrase. I give it a moment's rest, a few seconds at least. I recenter onto the, onto the um, sound. If you remember, I was listening to the recording, so then in my mind, I can just refer straight back to the sound of the music in a pure sense. So remind myself what it is I actually want to play in the head, just the sound, and then repeat the phrases where I just felt that myself creep into it, if you like. And then there's been many, many times now this process has led to um, a full autonomy, at least for that moment. Maybe the next day I come back and it's not quite there, but like the number of times I'm seeing like like as if I'm no longer even there and it's like uh, I'm just watching it unfold like this is becoming more, more and more frequent and then when I've done this for some time with a piece of music there often comes a point where I'm so like comfortable probably for the first time in my life that I suddenly have an urge just to play it and then I can just play it and I just just sat there and I just play it as if I never had a problem, you know. And like when that's happened, it, it's like it's been um, it's been like a spontaneous thing. But the feeling, I realised that feeling of like onwards, just playing the music and the flow, and like there's like an instantaneous spark where you are anticipating what's coming next but not anticipating the fail you're anticipating the lovely music that's about to come out and that's like um like the, that's what I, I believe a healthy musician who doesn't have a problem who's an elite player is actually experiencing this like spark where it just flows because they practice it they love it they know it and it's all about the music it's not about the body they don't have to worry about that because they trust themselves and the more i'm doing this the more i'm feeling the trust creep back in and it's still early days because I'm not, I don't think I've, I've still got a long way to go to like really um, strengthen up this mentality until it's totally done. But it does really seem at this point now that, that this is leading to like, like a proper resolution because you're not really seeking a resolution when you're working like this because you're actually living in the moment. You're only just playing the music. And the other phenomenon that's really come out of it, which is totally amazing is that I can actually hear what's coming out when I'm in this correct mindset. If you can imagine that for a minute, Katie, like um, when you've got like the, the dystonic memory, as you approach the problem, you can't hear properly because you're anticipating the problem. This anticipation you've trained yourself for years accidentally to do, so you can't stop doing it. You play, then afterwards, the few seconds after, or half a second, 10 seconds, whatever it is, you're analyzing subconsciously what just happened, you're measuring. So I started to realize that, that like, where you've got the problem, you've got like a rise up to it, and then your concentration's gone, and then you rise away 
meant you might get concentration back at that point. But at that point, you you basically you can't fix that because you've lost concentration. So if you if you're always losing concentration at that moment, it would never get fixed. And I think this is what the fundamental issue is. You see, so what I by retraining these responses, I've gotten a lot closer to them being able to hear through the problem. And that means when you can hear through the problem, because you've put so much effort into like visualizing the music beforehand, staying calm, practicing like for improvement, like healthily, leaving gaps in between so your mind's got time to process, then you can actually hear through the problem. And then when you hear, the brain can fix. Because when you hear, the attention is on what's there, not what you want or what you wish was there. Your attention is just in the here and now. And then the brain sees it's not working properly. And then it starts to fix it with some practice. And you have to do this quite a lot, obviously, because there's going to be so many triggers. There's going to be so many different like, like um, pieces of music and the things that potentially still have like really na nasty memories. But fundamentally, it rewrites the code little bit by little bit. And then you see, you see your skills return, you know, maybe not entirely at first, but it, it comes with time. So this is the way I've been working in, in the last few months. And it's been completely revolutionary, to be honest with you. It's fantastic. Katie says, um, um, give some advice to those who are recently diagnosed. Well, I would say it's going to be like a bereavement potentially initially, but it's worse than a bereavement because when somebody dies, you, you know they're gone and you get over it at some point. But with this condition, it's like somebody's gone missing and you don't know if they're dead. It's that bad. And it's that, you know, I'm not trivializing people going missing or dying, but to the person who's been diagnosed, it's as bad as those in many cases. It's a, a, a real trauma, real trauma. And the people who are around them probably won't realize that the tra trauma that they're going through inside, it's one of the, the biggest traumas you could ha have in your life, I believe, finding out that you've got this really serious condition that, you know, you, you don't know if you're going to be getting better from. And, you know, it does depend how severe you got it you might be lucky and maybe it's just uh, cracked in over a few months or a couple of years or maybe you've got a more ingrained version um and you know it doesn't mean that you can't make a recovery no matter what how bad it is because if you couldn't i still wouldn't be able to lift the piano laid up and you know i'd still be stuck there unable to play um and while i'm not fully recovered yet it's you know what if i look if i look back to two and a half years the difference in what I couldn't do then and what I can do now is it's just it's just a totally different world. So in that time scale, it is possible to to move things forward. And I mean, if you had a mild dystonia, you know, perhaps your recovery will be quicker. Um, but one of the things that's really important is to understand that if you're ch chasing a resolution to the dystonia, then you you go in after the wrong target because in many people's experiences. Um, people who chase the chase the end results just end up in a trap because the danger is you're constantly constantly measuring and looking and seeing if it's getting better and when you're doing that you're actually being the problem because that is the problem that's what dystonia is it's like self-measurement that's become ingrained and so the starting point of getting away from that behavior even before you can even start fixing the dystonia is to stop trying to fix the dystonia and think maybe take some time to reflect on why it is you've got to this point because there's a lot of people a lot of people who don't seem to be able to open up themselves even to their own selves they can't they can't even see the problem as for what it is for what it is so that initial soul searching i think is really important to really grasp the nettle about why it is that you can't play because you didn't develop dystonia it was very unlike there are a few examples where people develop dystonia because they've got other issues going on and i think maybe general dystonia isn't the same as this kind of dystonia because if you can do all other tasks in your life with no problem and and, and you've only got this one issue then you you've very likely got the same thing that i've explained um today in that you've created a bit of a monster in your own head without intent to do so. So in order to understand that monster, you really have to sort of understand yourself and get to the bottom of, 
of why this has happened. And um, to really move on with Estonia, you have to get to a point where you can accept what you've got now, because living in the here and now and being just happy to have a little toy about on your instrument without feeling loads of stress, because all you're worried about is the fact you can't play this crazy Rachmaninoff um, concerto or something. And that's, for now, that just put that to one side for now, yeah, because that's going to be for years to come, because nobody got to play Rachmaninoff piano concerto without, like, years of good stuff happening beforehand, because when they play that concerto, that's the culmination of their dedication and patience and excellent behaviours um, and peak performance mindset. That's what's led them to that point. So somewhere along the line, that's fallen by the wayside. And, like, getting to the bottom of that in your mind is probably a good place to start, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, I've really dug deep into the psychology behind this to really get an understanding. And when it, I, I suppose the complexity of the condition comes from uncertain knowledge. But when, in my own mind, I've spent so much effort exploring it, that even though I can't scientifically prove it, I'm pretty much sorted in my head, I know what it is. And that, I think that's why I'm able to explain to others with a reasonable degree of confidence. Even though I might not know everything, I think I probably grasp the nettle of the basics of the fact that, and it's act, once you understand, it's actually quite simple, is that somewhere along the line, you thought too much when you played because of all these various influences in your life. And when you thought at the same time as playing, it caused a, a, a loss of efficiency in your playing. And then you started to worry about it even more. So you thought even more until the point where you couldn't actually play because these thoughts became intertwined and subconscious and you couldn't do anything else. And it sounds really simple, but the behaviors led into that condition. And then the behaviors can lead out of the condition as well by actually back to behaving like a normal musician and at the, when you're like when you can't play it's really difficult because you, even if you want to behave like a normal musician you can't constantly keep getting interrupted by this horrible monster that you've created and one thing i will say uh, is you can't do everything at once and that you can't worry too much about the times when you like when the monster is like trying to come back in because otherwise you'd just be beating yourself up which again is like your ego again so you have to be quite kind to yourself and that when you have recognized that you've got the monster there and when you've done a little bit to overcome that and you've done some healthy thinking and you've moved your behaviors so that you're not having the voice in your head so much then you're doing a good thing and that the more times you do that you build up because with Estonia, I believe that you can't actually just switch it off. You have to have an alternative created, and that might take some time. So I'm still creating mine, but I can tell you something which is really bizarre now, because the new one is very strong, so I've been doing it for quite a while, and the old one is still there. I literally have two worlds. It's quite weird, because the Estonia is much weaker now, but it's still there. But so quite often, it just one whim, one thought... Um, will be enough to just go onto the new path. So I literally have two pathways. I, I can actually sense this in my mind. So like if the old path is just there a little bit, sometimes just one nudge in the right direction, say, and I, no, no, we need a new path. So I think, so a little bit of focus there. So I recenter my thoughts and I think, oh, I really want to play this. And I think about some loveliness of the music, you know, when I get stuck and I think, oh no, that music's really nice. And I remind myself how lovely it is. And then I'm on the new path. And then physically, the dystonia switches off, and I, I know it's gone, you know. And then whatever um, muscle memories are left, they start getting better really quickly because the muscle memory will correct fairly quickly. Um, and when it gets to this point, you can sense the difference between um, a muscle memory that still needs a bit of work and the dystonia itself. Because if you can hear the muscle, if you can hear the music being played with a slightly incorrect muscle memory then basically the dystonia is not there because you're not worried about it. It's only when you're worried about it or historically worried about it, as in, you know, the, the pathways that you've built up over the years. It's only when you're doing that, then you can't hear. And if you can't hear, you're basically using the wrong pathway. But to get to this point, I've spent a long time creating this new way. 
So as far as I'm concerned, you almost like walk away from the old self by creating a new self. So you're not trying to get rid of the old self because it's going to be there permanently. You're never going to be able to like remove neural networks. They might shrink over time, but you can't get rid of them. Just do a bit of scientific research and you'll find that out. It's that you don't really forget anything. It weakens over time, but and your brain probably clears up a little bit what you don't use. Um, but you can't really do that if you've got no alternative. So by getting back to the basics of learning how to be a musician, behave like a musician, and it might seem strange, but your brain is so like clever but stupid at the same time. If you do something for long enough or tell yourself something for long enough, it comes true. It's crazy. It actually comes true. Yes. Our our thoughts determine our perception. Absolutely. Absolutely. A very wise word. And I think it's really interesting that you bring up the psychology behind Dysonia because this is an area that is really hard to talk about uh, sometimes because there's a lot of what's the word uh, convolutity? I don't know what the word is. Like, you know, it's very hard to talk about it in a way where people can understand it. Um, but you did such a good job at it. And I think what's really important is that you really hit points on emphasis of like where our mindset should be. I, I'll tell you a quick story. I know we're coming to the end of this, but I got a very quick story I heard on the radio the other day. And this might help people understand the psychology, right? There was this um, psychologist writer guy who like was sort of plugging his book a little bit on the radio about why we should accept failing. And I thought, well, this sounds interesting. Let's have a listen to this. And um, basically what he said was he went on this windsurfing course, yeah. And um, like he'd never done it before. It was like a one day introduction and there was half a dozen people there. And he managed to get up on the board, but he just couldn't get off. He, every time he tried to move, every time the board moved, he'd fall into the sea, right? And he got to the end of the day and he felt humiliated. And the only thing that gave him some solace was the fact this guy next to him couldn't even stand up on the board all day. He couldn't even get on the board once. And he says to this guy, he said, oh, my God, that was awful. He said, I'm never doing that again in my life. And the other guy who couldn't stand up said, oh, I had a really good time. He said, I really enjoyed myself. And, um, and, and the psychologist guy said, yeah, but you didn't even get up on the board. And, he, and the other guy said, well, well, I might next time. And um, <laughs> a year later, um, like the psychologist was back on the beach, same beach, and he's seen this guy that couldn't get up on the board and he was windsurfing like a pro. He, he loved it that much. He kept coming back and he took some more lessons and he actually got good. And so the experience was almost the same. We were both absolutely hopeless. And one guy had a great time and went on to great things and the other guy just gave up. And that was all down to perception of psychology. So you think about that. That's just, it's just profound, isn't it? When I hear that story, I thought, oh my God, that is one of the most relevant things I've ever heard to do with dystonia. Is that, and it comes down to the very minute detail of when you play that note, yeah? Honestly, it is actually this, this fundamental. When you play that note, that's going to cause you the dystonic reaction. If you're like, manage to get your mindset so that you're um, the second windsurfer guy and that you think it's great, then eventually... <laughs> It does become great because you stop seeing the problem. And one of the fundamental issues is with people with dystonia is that I think fundamentally it's actually um, it's actually a problem of rhythm uh, in the sense of you don't want to like not hit the note in the right time. You could hit all the notes if it didn't matter how, if you if you weren't if you didn't have to keep time. Yeah, you could just take your time like a child does. Yeah, and if you get back to that like childlike learning where they're a bit stop start and they let let the mind have a little look and not rush and breaking that chain where that stress comes up and you've got the note and you just let it fail you let it come late if you feel a difference there and you suddenly feel it was easier because you left it a quarter of a second later and you missed the beat then that is a big clue to the psychological elements that are behind this condition if that makes sense mm -hmm. because the reality is that the well i say perfectionism i mean there's a lot of um, professional musicians who, who's playing is, 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 is near perfect. Um, and the reason why it's near perfect is because they've used like peak performance principles without even 
potentially realizing maybe just good luck for a lot of them. They've just found the right path. They practice in a healthy way. And, and the, the subconscious mind is so, so powerful that it is actually capable of playing exquisitely well to like where something you could class as perfect. Maybe you listen to a good recording and you think that was pretty much perfect. And that comes about when you're totally out of the equation. If you, even a tiny hint of the ego concern, worry, and it, it's never going to happen. But the machine inside in the, the mind is so powerful, it can easily do it. It's just we keep getting in the way of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's been a, a real pleasure, Katie. It's been really, really good. I really enjoyed it. You know, I thought, um, you know, it did take me a little while to get my head around the idea of, of telling everybody about this, you know, in person, because it's a big thing to sort of open up to that level. But then I realized that, you know, that's probably one of the best ways to face this condition is actually not be afraid to talk about it. You know, problem shared is a problem halved and all that. Yes, and thank you so much for having that courage too. It's like you said, you kind of, you get, kind of an idea of how far you have been cured when you're able to speak out about it. Yeah, without because I remember the first time I ever spoke to somebody about dystonia and told them I had it, I could hardly speak. It was like a, I didn't even realize. It was then I realized what an emotional trauma I was going through because I could barely even talk to them about it. I, I could, my throat all seized up. I, my, I couldn't speak. I, it was hard hardly any sound came out of my mouth the first time I spoke about Estonia with somebody, with a friend, you know, a trusted friend who was like, you know, never going to judge me. And I, even with him, I couldn't, couldn't speak. It was crazy. Holly's on here. I don't know if you saw her comment. She said, thank you, Richard. And, and uh, David Marquis also said, thank you both. Thank you, guys guys for your comment i think it'd be good to do it again like at some point when i'm like closer to recovery or recovered um whenever that is because you know maybe there's more maybe there's more insights to share and 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 as this one of the beautiful things is with this is dystonia is actually a, a, just a total gift in the end because you understand everything if you get out of it <laughs> i mean like when things start to really unfold and, and you really start getting somewhere and you understand what what's changed and why this is the case it's like wow this is fun and you start really getting you start enjoying it you know mm -hmm. it's like wow i'm actually getting into myself here it's it's, it's fascinating and, 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 and unlocking the um you know the potential in your mind the proper way you know well, thank you, Richard, so much for being with me today. We're going to go ahead and close out here. Thank you, Katie, for All your right, time. Well, thank you so much. Take care. Bye. All right, bye. <laughs>